All right. Um, our next speaker comes to us all the way from Michigan. Um, this is Dr. James Hancock, and he is a professor emeritus of the horticulture department at um, Michigan State University. Uh, he's also an expert blueberry and strawberry breeder. Uh, and among his accomplishments, uh, there are four varieties that stand out, uh, and those are uh, Northern Highbush, specifically Draper, Liberty, Aurora, and Huron. These are all uh, blueberry plants, and they have been sold and grown all over the world, roughly 20 million of the four cultivars I mentioned. Um, and this has helped Michigan to become the number one blueberry producing state over the last 70 years. And um, this is in part due to Dr. Hancock's work and varietal development. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this meeting. This is a fantastic forum get together, and I really like the idea of bringing outside students in as well so that you have the maximum amount of intermingling, which is great. Let's see. We, we don't need, you don't need to see the sidebar. There we go. I thought I'd start with a perhaps too pithy summary of the morning talks because it occurred to me that much of what I'm going to talk about was touched on by various people. But I, I think this is a fair summary that global CO2 levels are rising, temperatures are going to increase, along with the environmental variability. The productivity of crops will be negatively affected by these climate changes. Breeders need to get to work building new cultivars that are better adapted to high temperature and environmental variability. The genetic variability needed to make these changes is most likely going to be stored in the wild relatives. And genomic and marker-assisted selection and approved screening technologies will greatly facilitate this process. So we're really at the place where we know how to go about it. Now we've got to get busy with it. All right. And I'm, I'm going to talk about strawberries and blueberries, and I'm going to be dealing really with these aspects, and I'm going to show you where, like so many crops, even blueberries and strawberries are poised to make these kinds of changes. Um, and in fact, in blueberry breeding, we accidentally have been uh, breeding for climate change, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute, or maybe 10 minutes. What I want to do is describe the domestication of the dessert strawberry and the high bush blueberry. I want to detail the wealth of variability that exists in the natural populations of blueberries and strawberries. And I'll try not to belabor it too much, but I'll give you an idea at least of how variable they are. I'm going to describe the current gene pool of today's strawberries and high bush cultivars detail what has been done by breeders to harness the variability, and there's actually been quite a lot, again, done without any real thoughts about global warming, and then present a strategy that we can use uh, to use that genetic variability to cope with the global climate change. And I'll talk a little bit about genomic and marker-assisted breeding and phenomics, although I'm not going to get deep into it. One of the really neat things about strawberries and blueberries compared to many of the crops we've heard about is they are really young. The strawberry was domesticated 350 years ago. Um, I'll talk about both of these in just a second. And the modern cultivars still have a restricted base. So even though we've been at it for, compared to other crops, only 350 years, we're, we're still pretty narrow. Blueberries were domesticated actually a little less than 100 years ago, and our modern cultivars actually have an expanding genetic base, although most of what's grown out there now is rather limited. Again, it's a neat story with strawberries. It turns out that some Fregaria virginiana were collected in the eastern seaboard of the United States, somehow found its way to France, 
Gregaria chiloensis was collected in Chile by a French spy looking at Spanish fortifications. It found its way to France, and they accidentally hybridized together in a French botanical garden, and that's where our garden strawberry came from. Um, really remarkable. This is one of whoop. This is the IQ test, the pointer versus the clicker. Um, but hey, this is an old woodcut of that. But it's really a rem it's really a remarkable story. There wasn't any formal breeding really done until about the early to mid 1800s, and he worked with a very narrow germplasm base, mostly those accidental hybrids that had occurred, and a little bit of material from the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. I guess it wasn't the U.S. then, but you get the picture. It turns out that these two crops were incredibly complementary, so we really did have a lot of genetic variability they started working with at the very beginning. I'm not going to belabor this whole thing, but one was really red, one was not so red. Uh, one had white skin inside, one had red skin inside. Anything you look at any comparison, the two of them were really very complementary. But in spite of that hybrid background, our modern cultivars still have a very narrow genetic range, or genetic uh, background. And in the studies that were done a couple of decades ago, all the nuclear genes, or most of the nuclear genes, came from seven genotypes. Most of the cytoplasmic genes came from ten genotypes. Now, this study was done in 1990. The situation has improved a little bit, but in general, it is a really narrow uh, germplasm base that we're working with. Blueberries, as I said before, were domesticated really in the early 1900s, and the first crosses were made in 1922 by this gentleman, Frederick Covell. Um, Frederick worked with a New Jersey grower named Elizabeth White, they uh, had a contest where if people could bring them a blueberry that big, they would give them, I don't know, seven bucks or something. Um, and that was the basis of, of the blueberry breeding germplasm. Most of that stuff came from New Jersey. And this is his most successful cultivars. Now, Coville died about in 1928. But he left so many thousands of genes that the USDA filtered through them for another three decades. So it turns out most of our important varieties that were released before the 1950s really came from that original amount of germplasm that he worked with. He essentially used seven wild selections. Six of them were from New England. Um, those names up there are the selections. They were named after the growers that won the seven bucks. Um, and, and after a couple of generations of mating, this is the kind of percentages of each of these that wound up in the, in the cultivars. Does this graph make sense? Now I'm going to use this graph um, on and on, except I'm going to start putting species over here instead of just these wild clones. But in general, you can see. He also um, needed some some fungal resistance, he found this thing called crab four in North Carolina and, and used it in a very limited number of varieties. So there was a little bit of expansion, but most everything started from, from that germplasm. It turns out that 50% of the northern high bush are still in his varieties in, in the U.S. Most of it is blue crop, but there's still a lot of Jersey. And in fact, there's ruble, which was a wild selection that's still planted in Michigan. So obviously, I, like, I, I prefer to think he was extremely intelligent and a, a wonderful breeder and that not subsequent breeders were not so bright. But he was just exceptional. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the genetic variability that's been left in the natural environments after these initial um, uh, efforts. And it really is a veritable gold mine. If we look at the strawberries, let me give you a, a little bit more background about the strawberry. But the dessert strawberry that we eat is an octoploid. Um, it has two fundamental genomes and variants of those two genomes. It turns out that 
Fregaria virginiana and Fregaria chiloensis that made Fregaria ex ananasa, which happened in France. Those two subspecies, or those two species are completely compatible and they're completely compatible with the hybrid. So there's a lot of germplasm there. Um, there are diploid, tetraploid, hexaploid, and octoploid relatives um, all over the world. Uh, whoops, there, failed it again. Um, There are the diploid, tetraploids, and hexaploids are found all through that vast range. A diploid, a couple of diploids are found through there. The Fregaria chiloensis and the Fregaria virginiana, the octoploids that were the progenitor species, you can see they're essentially found from um, the Aleutian Islands all the way to central California, um, major populations in Chile, and then the virginiana goes all across the continental United States and Canada. And they're found, and from, from that you can really assume that there's a tremendous amount of variability that's available still out there. Um, if we look at the subspecies of Fregaria chiloensis, um, again, we've got that vast range. We've got four different, or five different subspecies, but it's really a, a vast range. Pacifica and Lucida, are found in this part of the world. Um, Chiloensis and Patagonia are found in this part of the world, and they actually, some found their way to the uh, Hawaii Islands as well. If we look at the kind of genetic variability that are found in these natural populations, I'm not really going to belabor it and, and go through each of these individually, but I, I want to point out that in some species, and in fact multiple species, they're living under extremely droughty conditions, high salt, low minerals, um, and uh, late flowering, cold tolerance, all of those sorts of phenomena that we're talking about that are associated with global warming. You can find native strawberry plants anywhere from hanging on rocky out cliffs right next to the, the beach in Northern California. That's Chad Finn, if anybody knows. You can find them on the driest of, of sand dunes in Southern California. Um, this is actually a commercial planting from Ecuador of Fregaria chiloensis, and you can see it's under some sort of harsh conditions. That's a picture in Chile. But the point is, is that there, all of these subspecies have a lot of rich genetic variability that we can access and use. As far as Virginiana is concerned, um, there, there are four different subspecies. Again, you see the very broad range that is encompassed by these subspecies. And again, if you go into each of the subspecies and where they're found and the kinds of conditions that are there, you find all of the things we're talking about in global warming again. And you know, it's not too hard to see a strawberry at 6,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains growing in sand in an area that it hadn't rained for a year and a half to expect that it probably has drought tolerance um, and uh, cold tolerance. And if you go next to the beach and there's a dune and there's a bunch of strawberries growing on it and it hasn't rained there in three months, it probably has heat tolerance and drought tolerance. So, it's not, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where you're going to find these traits that you're looking for. Um, in blueberry, it's not quite as broad, but what the breeders have done is actually broader than in strawberry, because in strawberry, most of the germplasm work has been done at the octoploid level, although you can, the diploids have been accessed. There are routes to do it, but it's easier to work at the octoploid level. In the blueberry, we've focused much more on the species and uh, less on the, the polyploid cultivated type, um, but it still shows, it still has the same diverse uh, variability that is accessible. At any rate, if you look at the situation, these are the blueberries, they are native to North America. There's a whole series 
of diploid species as you go down the country, um, which have, of course, adaptations to those various regions. Obviously, if you're looking for heat, uh, a sandy site in, in Florida is going to be more likely, it's going to be more likely to be there than in the maritime provinces of Canada. Um, Corymbosum in native range is right about in the middle. It is a tetraploid. Um, and then there is also a rabbit eye blueberry, which is a hexaploid found in the southern part of the U.S. But the point that I want to make here is that if you look across this range, here we're looking more across species than within species, but there's going to be a tremendous amount, there is a tremendous amount of variability found in those populations. And again, I'm not going to belabor this, but there's valuable genetic variability found in all of these from drought tolerance to heat tolerance to late flowering uh, to strong winter hardiness. What, whatever you want in most of these species, you can find it. Keep in your mind a little bit the species Vaccinium darrowi, which is found in Florida in the south, Vaccinium arboreum, um, which is found in, in the south, and Eliadei. And uh, keep in your mind, too, Vaccinium ashii, which now its real name is, is uh, Vaccinium verdatum. It's been changed as taxonomists do. Um, I mix it up, so I had to put both of them there. I, I haven't got myself doing it one way. But the point is, is that we've got a tremendous amount of variability, and I think you can, you can look at these uh, sites and see it for yourself. All right, well, what about what's been done as far as utilizing the natural variability found in strawberries and blueberries? Well, we're really lucky that a whole lot of people, really over the last 30 years or so, have been working on studying that native germplasm and at least getting it incorporated into the background of Fragaria chiloensis. Uh, a bunch of names here. I, you probably should take note of Jim Hancock, who's obviously <laughs> the one that's most important. But it, it's, been a, it's been a whole group of people that have, have, have done important work. And they've been active at collecting germplasm from the wild and evaluating it in field situations to get a real assessment of its performance. People haven't worried so much about the uh, climatic adaptations, but because they've been studied at multiple sites and collected from multiple locations, you can make some pretty good uh, ideas about what's there. But it's, it's impressive if you look at this list. I haven't counted this up, but it's got to be... It's got to be five to 6,000 different wild clones have been collected by different people and evaluated. Pretty impressive. Um, and myself and a number of these people got together some time ago now. It's probably been 15 years ago, but we, we, we filtered through all of these records on, and what people had found, and we decided we'd pick out what we call the super core, where we tried to pick the smallest number that we could that covered all the subspecies that we thought covered the range of the whole species complex um, and, when possible, have one that was studied that had a really good horticultural trait. Now, this was done by brute force, looking, thinking, asking, circulating. I'm sure there's a better way to do it. In a, in, in, with a spreadsheet and a computer, but breeders have a tendency to want to be artists and not statisticians, so we got it. But at any rate, we've got this group of 38 genotypes that we think represent the whole germplasm of, of, in nature. So we've ex essentially cataloged what breeders can use what, for what they want. And this just gives you a I see I left the slide a little bit. There are, there are no Chiloensis populations um, in the Pacific Ocean. Um, but I think you can see that we, we've got a pretty good representation of the uh, uh, geographical range of the, of the octopoids in the supercore. The supercore that was then taken and tested in a number of, of locations across the U.S., 
again, evaluated for a set of 20 horticultural traits that we could think of. So we have a background on the characteristics of each of these as far as their horticultural performance and how they performed at, at, at different sites. Um, and a more recent effort has gone on that was funded by the USDA through the Rosebreed um, program or the Rosebreed grant where another group of five North American strawberry breeders looked at another 900 strawberry clones that incorporates wild species, foundation cultivars, modern cultivars, and mapping populations, where we did the same sort of thing to get a better feel for how our uh, original super core was performing in the background of everything else. So we have that kind of information on, on an additional set as well. So we have this identifiable germplasm. Um, long before we all started on this, some people were playing with, with different clones and actually incorporated them. And I'll, I'll show you a, an example um, in, in a moment of, of an early success. But subsequent to these evaluations, really a couple of pretty formal um, attempts have been made by various breeders in this group that I, I've outlined to incorporate that variability into the background of Fregaria ananessa. And there's really been two approaches. One has been back, simple back crossing to ananessa, where a single clone with something desirable was back crossed several generations. Now, of course, this isn't a, a real back cross, as you all know, being trained as breeders. A back cross means you cross two individuals you pick one of the best progeny, cross it back to one of the parents, um, and then subsequently keep crossing it back to that same individual. Well, here we're talking about a, a, a wild species crossed to Fregaria ananassa and then back crossing into Fregaria ananassa from then on. So it's not quite a back cross, but it's, it, it accomplishes the same thing. And the other thing that we, a group of us have been working on is what we call reconstruction. And what we decided to do was take what was identified as the best clones of Fregaria chiloensis and Fregaria virginiana and do the hybridization that happened in France ourselves and see if we could do better. Okay? And we did, by the way. Um, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so essentially what we were doing is recreating the initial accidental hybridization but, with, but in a more... Uh, controlled manner. So the back crossing, I just pretty much described this, but, but as you can understand, after one generation, you'd have 50% wild blood in you in the, uh, the selections, another generation 25, and another generation you'd have 12%. Just typical old back crossing. What's pretty interesting is by the time you get to 12.5%, even if you start with small, soft, yucky, wild varieties, normally by then you're getting something that's at least close to commercial quality. It's often, it's often pretty soft, but its, its size really gets there, um, sometimes at 25%. But the point is it's relatively easy to, to make these hybridizations, so there's no real impediment to doing it um, unless you just don't want to. Uh, this is just some examples of um, elite stock um, uh, that's been developed. This is with, from the MSU program. A lot of this work was with Chad Finn. Um, uh, but all of these, these, all of these individuals have either 12% or 25% of the wild species in their background. And again, we're close enough to commercial quality to be trialed as potential varieties. So we can get there pretty quickly. You notice we've got things that have Virginiana from New York, Chiloensis from BC, Fregaria Chiloensis from Ecuador, Virginiana from Minnesota, and Virginiana from Wyoming. So that's a reasonably diverse set of germplasm in just this handful of parents. 
The major back crossing success that I mentioned earlier was my advisor, uh, Dr. Roy Springhurst, who developed the day neutral strawberry, which essentially revolutionized the strawberry industry 35 years ago, something like that. He actually got the genes to do that from a wild clone of Fergaria virginiana. So long before the rest of us have started to embark on this germplasm uh, collection work, um, he had a, a, major, a major, major success. This was, this Fregaria virginiana came from the Wasatch Mountains in Utah. It was, it was near the favorite camping place of Roy Springhurst and his family. He has all these pictures of his children growing up next to this clone of Fregaria virginiana. So he had the right idea because he could see that it was day neutral, but it's really kind of nice that it was also his family's favorite camping place. So, okay. <laughs> On the reconstruction work, the way Chad, Chad Finn, myself, uh, Jim Luby, Stan Hokinson approached this was we took individuals of the super core, and different individuals of the super core, and we improved one generation within Virginiana, so we took the different clones from Virginiana, crossed them, picked out the best, we took, we did the same thing with the Chilowensis. We got the best individuals um, of Virginiana to use in the next round of crosses, the best Chilowensis to use in the next round of crosses, and ultimately we made our Fregaria ex Ananasa in a controlled fashion here, where it was 50-50, and now what we're doing is doing more recurrent selection within these populations, but we're also back-crossing to Fregaria and Anasa. But the exciting thing that happened was some of these original FX and Anasa populations had humongous fruit, almost commercial quality. These have been checked with markers, by the way, to make sure that there wasn't some stray pollen. Um, and what was... What is really cool about some of these families, this was by far the most impressive, is it has four different subspecies in it. 25% of each of these species, from one of them's from Ontario, one of them's from Montana, one of them's from California, and what, the other one is from Chile, meaning in this one clone, we've probably captured more diversity than anybody else has ever captured in the world, in any crop. I hope. <laughs> um, and I mean, and this just shows all the traits um, that it, it's definitely segregating for. Um, I don't have heat tolerance in there, but there's all kinds of good stuff. Um, it also turns out that it's resistant to some emerging soil pathogen problems, and it may actually work out to be a useful parent from, from that point of view. What about blueberries? Um, I've already told you what Frederick Coville did and Elizabeth White did, um, but there's also been a number of important people working on it. George Darrow, um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about him, but he was one of the original collectors and studiers of germplasm. But Ralph Sharp in Florida, and also Paul Irene, which I'll say a lot about in Florida, and Arlen Draper and Jim Ballington have, have worked prodigiously at, at, at storing wild germplasm. And again, what they've been doing is they've been focusing on the, the progenitor species of Vaccinium darrowi, the diploid. And it turns out that the diploids produce um, a high number of unreduced gametes. And so in many cases, you can combine those diploids with the tetraploid vaccinium corymbosum, which we cultivate, and get a fertile F1. It's an amazingly promiscuous genome across the blueberries, if you will, but they live, generally they live happily together. Um, and there are also roots where if you take the hexaploid virgatum ashii and cross it with the tetraploid vaccinium corymbosum, you can get pentaploids 
which have reasonable fertility in, in crossing back to the tetraploids. So we can bring the genes in from both the higher ploidy and the lower ploidy into those populations. Ralph Sharp is really the first one to go after this. And what he, he had this idea, I'll show you a map in a minute, but he and, and, and George Darrow decided they wanted to develop the highbush blueberries so it could grow in the southeastern U.S. Before that time, it was the northern highbush. It had a chilling requirement of 1,000 to 1,200 chilling hours, so it couldn't grow here. So what Sharp decided was he was going to cross the uh, corymbosum, the, the northern highbush with a lot of southern species, and hoped that he could then build of something that would grow in the southeast that he could still call a high bush. Now, this is what I mean about, um, he didn't know it. When would this have happened? 1950? 1955? Something like that? He was uh, breeding for global change. But he was, act he thought he was actually breeding, breeding for geographic expansion. But if you think about it, he was also breeding for global change. The two are very compatible. Oh, sorry. So he, he went crazy crossing with, with uh, native species that are found in the southeast. This is another tetraploid um, that's found in the southeast. And he thought, wow, this is going to be the ticket because it should be really fertile. Well, that, it didn't produce anything worth squat. Um, he had some interesting stuff with Ashii after about uh, 1,000 back crosses. Um, but the, what became the real winner was he crossed this Vaccinium corymbosum by Vaccinium darrowi, which was a diploid but produced unreduced gametes. And this ultimately became the real source of the southern adaptations in the northern high bush. It's much more complex than that, but... I, uh, you know, you've already know I like to trivialize things. But what's really amazing is Vaccinium darrowi is not only, you know, it's, it's drought adapted, heat adapted. It happens to be evergreen while the northern high bush is deciduous. So there's a combination going on there that's also pretty dang cool. Um, at any rate, he, he did this. Um, and he got at least the first varieties that could be grown, the southern hybrids that could be grown in the southeastern United States. I'm going to race through a lot of these types of graphs as we go through other people and what they've done, but I, I, I just want to kind of explain it to you. But this is, uh, these are at the top there, these are three northern uh, highbush species. These are different southern highbush species. And through this back crossing and what have you, um, these are the percentages of each of those species found in the background. Is that okay? What, I mean, really jumps out at you is that when he got his two that he released and, and had some impact on the industry, they were only about, at best, 56%. Uh, Corombosum, so these outside genes were working that well. Arlen Draper um, subsequently uh, from the USDA took it upon himself to get as much of all the other diploids into the northern highbush background. Um, and he, he made these complex hybrids that he'd, he'd cross. He crossed something that was northern adapted with southern adapted and get a hybrid out of it and then he'd cross that with something else that was northern adapted. And at any rate, he was, through that, he mixed up all of these different diploid species. These are just initials. You don't really need to know what's what. Um, but these are the different percentages of the different species. And then Arlen himself took these complex hybrids and then he offered them to other people to use um, and bingo, he started to generate a whole series of different varieties with different proportions of species material in them. Um, and uh, 
different species and different amounts of those species. And this is just an example of some of his varieties uh, that proved to be southern adapted um, and the relative proportions. Whoops. I love Biloxi because it, it, we call it a northern high bush, but it doesn't even have the majority of its genes from Vaccinium corombosa. But you can see the different uh, percentages that he used. It's also interesting to note uh, that he wound up incorporating. It's also interesting to note that a lot of Vaccinium darrowi obviously wasn't important to southern high bush. You could use other species to do the same thing because that one doesn't have much at all. This is the northern high bush. He actually then took some of that stuff that had southern blood in it and used it in northern high bush breeding and found out that he could select northern high bush that had southern blood in it. And these are some of the varieties and their different proportions. Draper, Liberty, and Osorno are three that, that, that I've released using some of his bloodlines. And you can see that even for very northern conditions, we've got southern, a lot of southern high bush blood that can be incorporated. Turns out it's a very fortuitous combination, but some of these, species, these southern species don't have particularly impressive or tasty or crunchy fruit, but in the background of the northern high bush, they really express a high fruit quality. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a bonus to us in, on, on a number of cases. And I think Draper was kind of a breakthrough cultivar with its firmness and storability, and I really think that has to do with that 2% vaccinium darrowi we accidentally captured the right genes. Jim Ballington um, was doing the same sort of thing with many different species, and he produced, again, a whole bunch with, with different percentages. He was the first to incorporate large amounts of this Eliadii. This is kind of interesting that this one is a southern high bush, but it doesn't have Vaccinium darrowi. So there are of different roots that you can produce what it is you want. Um, and then the breakthrough, the really big breakthrough came through Paul Irene's work um, here in Florida, where he again was making liberal use of the southern highbush species. He did a lot of his own work. Um, his own germplasm utilization. He obviously also used a lot of Sharpe's lines. But he produced what we consider to be the breakthrough southern highbush cultivar star, Emerald and Jewel, which essentially took the blueberry, the warmer blueberry region by storm, if you will. Um, these are just kind of the percentages of the various things that were he incorporated into his different varieties. He also used Eliadii instead of uh, high percentages of Darrowi. He also, uh, in the last decade, released these things from Vaccinium arboreum, which is in a, a whole other section of blueberries that has also worked extremely well in the northern highbush land. Um, and, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, the range expansion associated with the development of these southern high bushes is, is truly remarkable. This is a, while I was not paying attention to somebody else who was speaking, I made this little chart because I, I wanted to, to show you this. But this, this is what we had. This was the range, very northern. This was the range after the work of Sharp and and. Draper, and then, of course, the breakthroughs from Lyrene, really moving into to a, a warmer regions, if you will. These have then exploded into Chile, Mexico, Peru, Spain, and Africa, while the northern have also moved into Chile, Asia, and Pacific. But that's an incredible expansion. And one wonders if those northern high bush that we've released that have some southern high bush in them might not have more heat tolerance than what we were working with before. And in fact, we have circumstantial evidence that one of my more recent, recent releases, Osorno, has stood unusually well um, in hot 
in hot summers in Oregon and Michigan. So it, 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 that may indeed be true, but that needs to be really evaluated. This, I think, tells the story. You know, this is obviously it's oversimplified, but it shows the various locations where northern high bush are, the various locations southern high bush are, sort of the mean high temperatures and the mean low temperatures in those places, the rainfall, the chilling hours, and I think we're looking at a, a six degree C increase in the taller, taller What's the, how well they take it. <laughs> and the other remarkable thing is with the species that before required 800 to 1,200 chilling hours, we now have essentially varieties that can work at zero to 1,000. Truly, truly remarkable. So if we talk about the, the germplasm that's available to strawberry and blueberry breeders to, to address our changing environment, essentially we've got an incredibly rich amount of genetic variability that's been stored. By the way, I'm not done yet, so don't be sighing relief. I'm going to keep going here after this slide. Um, but we've incorporated genes of eight different wild species into the genetic background of the high bush blueberry and documented that we can indeed increase uh, temperature tolerance, um, just serendipitously, if you will. And we also have genes of 10 different octoploid subspecies that have been incorporated into the genetic uh, background of the dessert strawberry. This hasn't really been exploited yet for cultivar development, but it's there and it's ripe and it's ready to go. Okay. And I'm going to whiz through this, but I, I, I think it needs to, to, to be stated if we want to fully concentrate on developing types that are adapted to this changing environment, higher variability, higher temperatures, more drought. It would make a lot of sense to take this germplasm we've developed, team it up, team it up with genomic and marker-assisted selection um, and move as fast as we, we can. Somebody just has to decide to do it and this is the way to do it. And the other thing I, I want to say, and again, I'm going to whiz through this because, you know, how many slides you want to see of, of what's been done in, in strawberry and blueberry, but, oh, I, I'm sorry, I was going to make another comment. A, a reason, not only by the speed we can move, another huge reason for using marker-assisted or genomic selection is that these traits that we want to evaluate, if we're going to focus on that, as we've already heard from a number of talks, are really painful to screen for. Screening for drought, you know, a breeder can work with 5,000 or 30,000 plants. A breeder can't put each one of those in sand in the greenhouse and, and take the water away from it and then only plant the ones in the field that survive. It's just not going to happen. Or put them all under a, um, in three different growth chambers that have different temperatures um, you put 5,000 in three different growth chambers and find out which ones you want to put in the field. So if we go through those arduous comparisons on smaller groups, find markers, and then use those markers to screen the breeding population, then it's possible. And that's a big reason why a, a lot of breeding population programs haven't um, done this sort of work is simply because it's so difficult to screen um, that it wasn't possible. But if we got the markers, we can do it that way. The other thing that was just mentioned briefly, uh, but I think is important, is we've got a number of technologies now. I think you mentioned that. We've got another of emerging technology which actually have been used more on agronomic crops that, that use spectral metry and thermography and, and scanning whole fields or even quickly scanning individual leaves that, that can give us really good information on drought and heat tolerance 
that we could be using in conjunction with these markers or to develop these markers that we're not employing in fruit crops to any extent now, I don't think. At any rate, I'm, I'm not going to make a, a big deal out of this, but I, I just want to say that, that the, uh, the blueberry, uh, a hybrid combination, has been sequenced. So we've, we've got lots of, of, of uh, markers that we can work with, lots of genes we can work with. Um, they've been, the uh, early maps have been made of these, so we've got linkage maps that we can work with in QTL analysis at diploid level. We have a physical map so we can uh, align things as we want. And we've done a considerable amount of work um, in a high bush blueberry cross where we've crossed them, uh, sequenced them, identified a tremendous, uh, identified tens of thousands of markers. Those are being put on chromosomes. We've evaluated them in the field at different locations um, for those traits. And actually, some of you may know Joseph Mangati. Um, he's now doing a QTL analysis uh, of those to, make, to, to identify those different traits that we've evaluated. Um, I don't know what's happened to this project. Jim Olmsted was, was, was going to search for QTLs for uh, root architecture and pH tolerance in um, arboreum hybrids. Is that, is that, no? Well, I guess if you're giving me a no, it, it didn't happen. <laughs> it could happen. <laughs> um, and also, uh, the, the private company that I work with now, Barry Blue, has undertaken a, a major project to uh, begin genomic selection in uh, essentially um, all of our breeding material within a couple of years. So all the background is, is ready to do these sorts of things in blueberries. And in strawberries, it's the same sort of situation where we have, uh, we have genomes that are totally sequenced in diploids and, and octoploids. Um, we've got uh, intricate maps that have been developed, linkage maps to do QTL analysis. We've got a uh, Affymetrix Axiom chip uh, that we can use to evaluate large populations of strawberries. In fact, we've done some um, of that um, with, with the breeding project that I'm working with, with the rose breed. Um, and a, a number of efforts have been undertaken to look for QTLs for many developmental traits and also um, aromatics, what have you. Actually, I would say Vance Whitaker was probably one of the leaders in this effort. So the point is that everything is in place to, to, to we've got the germplasm developed that we could use. We've got the markers developed and the maps and the technology developed to use the marker approaches so that if somebody really wanted to focus on um, climate change and strawberries and blueberries, everything's there for it. It just, it's just, it's a matter of interest at this point. So to kind of wrap this up, breeding strawberries and blueberries in a change in global environment, everything is in place to rapidly develop new cultivars of blueberry and strawberry to meet the challenges of climate change. Because a wealth of genetic diversity exists in wild population that has already been harnessed into elite breeding stock. The genomes have been sequenced and a plethora. That's the first time I use that word. <laughs> I, I wanted to see, say, pleiathora. A plethora of DNA diagnostic markers have been mapped to facilitate ma marker-assisted breeding and, and, and genome, genomic breeding. And essentially everything is in place for breeders to focus on developing elite types for our evolving variable environment. And that's my story. <laughs> Round of applause for Dr. Hancock. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, come on. <laughs> Pardon me? Who's it? 
Dessert strawberry. Yeah. As a uh, desert strawberry. I, you know, we don't have a desert strawberry. It's not quite that good. <laughs> but I'd, I'd, say, I'd say that a strawberry living on the sand dunes in, in uh, Southern California probably has some, some tolerances that we can use. No. Uh, the challenge is it, with with strawberries and blueberries. Well, the the blueberries we've accidentally done it. So I mean we've done it, and we're doing it. Um, we haven't focused so much on global change, but we focused on geographic range expansion, um, and we also accidentally got higher temperature tolerance for fruit, I think. Um, so we accidentally did it. Um, and strawberry, it hasn't been done. We haven't done that sort of range expansion. The thing about the strawberries and blueberries is, you know, they're, they're grown in places with irrigation. And, and because, because of that, we've sort of supplemented whatever change would occur, we, we can take care of it. So there, there hasn't been any real push. It's not like many of the agronomic crops that are grown in marginal environments across the world where these changes have had a major impact on their productivity. So the, the need has been there. The need hasn't been with strawberries and blueberries because, you know, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but they are a luxury. Um, and they're grown in luxurious environments. <laughs> yes? What have you learned on what you learn in terms of mechanical harvest? Uh, in strawberry, every once in a while, people work on a mechanical harvester for a long period of time. There's been several harvesters over the decades. Um, it's really impossible to get a harvester that knows only to pick the right fruit you get a hodgepodge. Mechanical harvesters for blueberries, on the other hand, um, there are harvesters out there that on most days will harvest fruit for the fresh market. But have you made any blueberry efforts? I think that's been a major effort in Florida. Yes. <laughs> major effort. Funded by a major, major grant, I believe. I certainly. I mean, and they've. I mean, the well, there's a big push in Peru now to grow them. Um, also, they're not only you know they're they're, they're not only no till, but they're repeat flowers, and you can actually get a double system. Uh, most they mostly don't do that because um, the early crop competes with the North American crop, so they prune them to, to get only one crop when they can get the most money. Absolutely, absolutely. I, and there's, that's, that, I mean, that's where the expansion is just beginning to occur now. At, well yeah, your, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. I mean, 
if, if you're essentially going to be using a genome scan to improve drought and heat tolerance, you might as well use a genome scan to, to pick up big fruit and firm fruit too. Now, your second point, I mean, so if you're going to do it for one thing, you might as well incorporate it. And, I mean, there's evidence in many populations, well, you, you don't necessarily do better than the breeder might have without it, but you do better than a few markers. Um, what was the other point I was going to make? Well, the second point I make is the difference genetic mechanism. Yeah, I, I, I don't ever envision that that the whole program would be that. You're going to always, I don't know what the percentage is, I haven't really thought this through, but the breeder is going to be wanting to bring in all kinds of new germplasm all the time and making crosses and looking for good stuff. And then that gets transferred to the genome scan in, in subsequent generations. So like my old major professor before, before we had marker technology, but it was his point that a good breeder does about 75% cultivar development and 25% germplasm development. And that's how I see markers versus conventional. As you're right. I mean, if you don't have the, the variability in your population that you're using the markers for, you can't access it. Yep, but I think that's something you do. And so you keep injecting it. Keep injecting. And you might want to use markers if you have a unique, if, if you want to search for unique genes at a, at a locus. You might want to use your markers in your wild germplasm to find those that might be unique. So, but I, I never, I, I can't ever see it stopping uh, conventional breeding. No, no, I know. Yeah. Well, there are those who say that. I'm, I'm actually with this very blue project. Um, these, the, the board, of very blue, is so freaking excited about what we, how we can predict these genotypes and let's put less in the field. They actually don't want to do any conventional breeding anymore. I never thought that would happen, but that would be a terrible mistake. Okay, the, I, I argued from the very beginning that information that about maps and genes in the diploids is not very useful for octoploid breeders. I mean, we have to identify our linkage relationships and our genes, uh, the, the diploid work has been valuable because it's given us a, a baseline. It also has given us an idea about where important traits are located. But I can give you an example. I mean, the, the genetics of the de neutral trait in the diploid is completely different than the octoploid. So if we were trying to use the diploid, um, we, we would fail. So uh, now, building a map in the octoploid is a royal pain in the butt because it's an octoploid. You got all this redundancy in genes, but I think you just have to do it. It is, it is mostly disomic inheritance, so it's doable. It's doable. A second question? Um, if, if I was, wanted to be a breeder today, um, I would make sure that I was comfortable with genomic technologies so that if I wanted to be conventional, if I wanted to be a, 
hands-on breeder. I can converse with the genomicist I'm going to have to converse with. And if I was a genomicist, I'd want to have the fundamental understanding of what plant breeders do so that I could converse with the plant breeders. And the bottom line on genomicists working with applied plant breeders is that you're both going after the same traits that the genomicists are seeking out in helping you find markers for genes that you need in the breeding program and not the genomicist is working on this really interesting pathway and you're working on fruit quality um, and unless you're working on the same thing, you're not going to help each other. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, we are out of time. <laughs> Thank you, though. Very good talk. <laughs>